Good evening. Hello. Welcome to the Kellogg Hubbard Library. My name is Rachel Sonnachal. I'm the program and coordinator, program and development coordinator here at the Kellogg Hubbard Library. And I want to welcome all of you here. It's very nice to see you. Some of you I know quite well, and some of you a little bit, and some not at all. So it's, that's always a nice mix. Um, this program is particularly special uh, for me. It is sponsored by CCV, um, and we will have the pleasure of having the president of CCV, uh, Joyce Judy, introduce Peter Smith this evening. And I'm thrilled that my friend Samantha Kolber is here with Bear Pond Books and is selling uh, Peter Smith's books. And um, my friend Wendy is back there, and she and I took three or four CCV classes together. So we, we have uh, a special uh, affection for CCV. We took photography and digital image management. Um, so CCV is for all people in all ages, and, and I just love that. Um, so I also want to thank Orca Media and John Jose, who is videotaping tonight's program. And the um, video will be on their website, so you'll be able to go and watch it anytime and tell your friends and neighbors and family members uh, that they can, can see it. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it will live online, but under some series. Sometimes it's the library and sometimes it's Bear Pond Books. So either one, if you look, you'll find it. Um, so I would like to uh, invite President uh, Joyce Judy to, uh, to the stand. And thank you, Rachel, and thank you for inviting us um, to co-sponsor this with Bear Pond Books. It's, um, it's really, truly a pleasure. And it is an amazing opportunity for me to introduce our founding president, Peter Smith. It hit the core values of accessibility affordability, innovation, and the importance of the adult learner have been part of Peter's thinking and development for 50 years. And those are the same core values that he instilled at CCV when CCV fa was founded in 1970. We are soon to celebrate our 50th anniversary, which is quite, quite amazing. Um, yeah. So Peter, you've been at this for a long time. Um, but you know what, as I was thinking about tonight, I, I am pretty certain that Peter, in 1970, could never have imagined when they started with 10 classes and 50 students here in Montpelier, that today, CCV would be, this fall, we, are enrolled, we have enrolled 6,000 students in 850 classes, and a third of those classes are online. So we've gone from a teeny little institution, Peter's sort of vision, to today the second largest college in the state of Vermont. And we serve more Vermonters than any other college, which um, when Rachel was talking, it is for everyone. You will see whether you're in a class <coughs> of photography or English comp or whatever. You'll have 17 and 18 year olds who are in classes for dual enrollment. They're still in high school taking a college course. You will see we serve a lot of veterans we serve career changers, we serve people who are senior citizens who are looking to either pivot to a different career at that point in their life or just want to pick up a skill. And then we also see people for whom never, they never thought that college was possible and all of a sudden they've decided they want something better for themselves and their families. So you see just a huge diversity. So, um, so CCV has become a force in the state of Vermont. We have 12 locations, we're in each of the 12 labor markets. And, um, you know, we, I still so believe that we are built on the same bedrock that, um, and we continue to, to flourish on the same bedrock that um, Peter thought about um, when he and Governor Dean Davis um, helped to found um, CCB. But Peter has had a really long and distinguished career in higher education. But I think the thing that's, for me, that sets him apart from other people that have spent their life in, in higher education is that he really has a passion for innovation. He is always pushing the envelope. CCV is an example. But throughout his career, he has always been sort of 
pushing that envelope. And so just as for people who don't know this, and this is why I had to bring some notes because it is long, I could never have mem memorized this. So here's some highlights from his, career, his professional career. I think many of you in this room probably know that he was a state senator here from Washington County. He also served as Lieutenant Governor for Vermont. Then he was um, Vermont's congressional representative um, to the U.S. House. Then he got into academia, left academia, got into po political life, came back to academia. He was Dean of George Washington University's Graduate School of Education and Human Development. He also then founded CCV, but he also founded um, the California State University at Monterey. So he's had the distinguished pleasure of, of creating two colleges, one in a small, teeny state and one in a really big state. In addition, he was also the assistant director um, for general, general for education of UNESCO, for people who don't know that, United Nations Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. He also served as senior vice president and Kaplan. But today, he is currently the Orkin um, Chair and Professor of Innovative Practices in Higher Education at the University of Maryland University College. And I believe, Peter, if I counted right, this is your fourth book um, that you've written um, on higher education. But what I think is really important about this book is it really draws on and connects his whole career. It talks a lot about um, how important it is if we are going to continue, that higher education continues to need to be innovative, flexible, and will look more like the CCV that Peter created than what we have come to know, um, it, we, what we see in a lot of higher education institutions. So to read to us tonight from Free Range Learning in the Digital Age, The Emerging Revolution in College, Career, and Education, please welcome Dr. Peter Smith. Wow. Let me, um, let me destroy the microphone. Okay. Um, reinforce one thing that Joyce said, and it, you know, it was one thing to have the idea and to have the great opportunity to work with an amazing group of people in those first seven or eight years when none of us had a clue as to what it could turn into. And it's because of people like Tim Donovan and Joyce and I think remarkable staff and frankly Vermont State College's boards uh, who have been consistently supportive of a, a notion that was so far out of the mainstream at the time that it was almost hard to find it with binoculars. Um, I'm at the risk of making a mistake, but I want to introduce John Turner who uh, was on the ground in Brattleboro, Vermont in 1971. And you want to talk about nasty. He was really, he and Tom Yan and those original people down there, they were really amazingly um, courageous. And so this is, uh, I love my role. You know, nobody's ever asked me to run a university or college. They've only asked me to start them. And there's, there's a reason for that. <laughs> because it, I make, I say, I make snow, and then people like Tim and Joyce and John and everybody, they make snowballs. Uh, but my job is to help create the snow. Um, so the, the real work can then be done to benefit people. And uh, uh, it's, it's just been a wonderful, a wonderful ride. I'm going to talk a little bit about the book, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time <coughs> Uh, on it, uh, I'm going to spend more than a little, but I'd really love to get any questions any of you may have um, about uh, what I'm saying about the logic uh, that I'm trying to wrestle with, um, <clears throat> and any questions that it, that may raise. And I know that it's a beautiful night, and I know that you know, people want to go home at some point, so we'll try to keep this uh, humanly uh, humanly um, doable. There's 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 three dimensions in this book. Um, one is a human dimension. I interviewed about 50 people, and I have to say that it was, for me, a life-changing experience as well in terms of how it deepened um, my understanding of some of the things I've been fighting for and standing for all my life, but not maybe understanding the, the human dimension of the importance of this work and what it has become. And then I... 
uh, interviewed five college presidents of what I call adult-friendly colleges, one of whom was Joyce, because how could I not? Uh, because CCV is still, in many ways I say, regrettably unique, almost, in American higher education, which is crazy, um, because it's so good. And by the way, we have something here in Vermont, and yes, I still say we, um, that I don't think operates, it, the language sounds the same, but we have, the, the relationship they have with their 12 learning centers, with the local high schools and with the Vermont State Colleges and the university and the coming and going and up and down and the external baccalaureate degree and all that, there really isn't another system in a, and then we have ironically sort of a non-system here. I mean, you know, there's no coordinating board, but there's nothing quite like this still in the rest of the country. Um, uh, there are systems people would use the same words to describe, but it doesn't work the way it works here. And it's just really a story worth telling. So there's an institutional part, and I call them adult-friendly colleges, and trying to identify what it is about the institution of the future, regardless of what it looks like or where it operates or any of the rest of it. Um, what are the characteristics? And then I went and talked to some entrepreneurs about, because there are people out there trying to put together learning support services related to jobs and all sorts of other things. And they don't give two hoots about higher education. They want to help people get where they want to go in their life's journey. And some of them are making money at it. We may have feelings about that. Others are nonprofit. But the, but the uniting factor is they're saying, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's things we can do. And if colleges and universities don't wake up and start doing some serious adapting, I um, I, I think some of them are going to be in some real trouble. So the, those are the three. I'm going to focus tonight on the, on the human element because at the end of the day, this is all about people and their lives and their position in the community and the opportunities they have or don't have. And if you add that up, it really becomes about the soul of, of the United States of America, the soul of Vermont, and what are we trying to do with and for people of great talent who simply got left left out of the out of the game, in many cases through no fault of their own, and I'm going to tell you some of those stories. One step back, I don't know how many of you know the theory of disruption, um, and not to get too arcane on you here, but there's a guy who did some work in the 90s. He was trying to figure out why of the five largest mainframe computer companies, four of them went bankrupt from being blue chip to bankrupt in three years. And the only one that didn't was IBM, and they damn near did. And what he found, his name's Clayton Christensen, what he discovered was <clears throat> that the whole culture of these businesses, which was wildly successful, and they're making four million bucks every time they sell a mainframe computer, and they got customers, and they got branding, and they got employees. Well, along comes this funny little gizmo, I can't remember what it was called, but made by some guy named Jobs. And it was 200 bucks, and it was a clunky game. And they didn't have time for that. And then it cost 400 bucks, and it did more than games. Then it, then it cost like 700 bucks, and it could do almost everything that, that big old fat mainframe could do. But they couldn't figure out how to make money on a $700 machine when they were selling $4 million machines, and their customers loved them. So the theory of disruption, is, because this guy's saying, these people weren't dumb, but they all went out of business. And they went out of business because the way they were set up was simply being attacked from outside by forces they didn't control. And the only reason IBM survived, it turns out, is I think it was Lee Iacocca, that I'm any big fan, but they, he took $200 million and 200 people and sent them to another state and said, we're going to be out of business in two years if you don't figure out what the new IBM ought to look like. So he took them away from the culture and away from the economics and away from it and said just, and they invented the new business services IBM that barely survived. So there's, there's a thing about when culture can be the greatest thing in the world and we guessed right or instinctively were right or inadvertently were right in the sense that learner-centeredness has become more and more and more real and important and doable in the 50 years since we started in a way that nobody could have 
imagined. Um, and so what's happening today, and this is not a critique of higher education. The stories are going to be, uh, they're going to not shed a lot of positive light in some cases because the life examples um, of these people are, are, are hard. Um, and these are the success stories. Uh, and several of them are CCV or Vermont State College external degree program graduates. But the whole notion that higher education is now beset by forces that it can't control. All this information, complexity, richness, AI, algorithmic, intelligence, none of which I understand. I just ask questions and get smarter people than me to answer them. Then we go do it. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is the old university was an island of information richness in an information poor community. And today, and so you have labs and libraries and smart professors, and there was no other option. No other option. And what has changed in our day, when we did the work here, was a philosophical statement about values and what we thought was a better way to do business. Today, it has become an essential reality that if people don't adapt and institutions don't adapt, they are going to be hurt, compromised, and in some cases, die because the reality we can do really good things for significantly less money, de develop marvelous learning outcomes, including the liberal arts. This is not about DIY does not mean, or free range learning does not mean DIY learning. Learning's a social activity. Learning takes people, it takes people working together. Uh, but it does mean we can do things almost any place, any time, very effectively and efficiently uh, with a very high quality and in a way that can be done not just with dozens of people, but, but with thousands of people and tens of thousands of people. So to me, th that's why uh, what's changed and what the book is about is showing it from a human perspective. And I want to, to me, the, the rest of it, um, if we're moving away from colleges being about themselves and making the learner adjust as opposed to learning opportunities being about what the learner needs and wrapping their resources and their aspirations around the learner. And you know, are there some exceptions? Sure. I mean, do I want a brain surgeon who learned, you know, informally? Uh, no, probably not. Or an engineer. Of course there are exceptions. But for the vast, vast majority of people, we can do things in a way that we could never have dreamed of before. There are some terms that I employ in the book uh, that I want to just describe. First is called personal learning. And personal learning is all the learning you do in your life, uh, whether it's in a college or in the military or in a club or informally. It, it is the whole uh, aggregation of, of everything you do and how it affects you. And the thing that's interesting is a fellow named Alan Tuff, who recently passed away, unfortunately, a Canadian researcher, and he identified, which has been has been proven again and again and again in a, uh, studies that started in the mid-60s. The average adult in America, but it's also true in, on every other continent, spends more than 700 hours a year learning things purposefully. Now, divide that by 50, just to keep it simple. I know there's 52 weeks, but divide it by 50. That's a lot like 15 hours a week doing something focused that is going to, because you want to, because it's going to change you. And if you think about it, our folk culture, ooh, that was my knee going away. Our folk culture promotes that. Live and learn. School of hard knocks. Older but wiser. But we don't know how to convert it. Do it CCV, but in general in American higher education, they don't know how to convert all that learning to value, to academic value and to social and civic value and to economic value. And to me, the other thing that Tuff found out is that for all the learning people do, they forget that they know it. So, and you think of it, it goes in there and it structures who you are and you're always changing and growing. But you, you can't say, well, yeah, in 1972 I learned uh, about China. You know, you don't remember that until you're asked to go back and think about all those experiences 
and I'm going to read you a couple of stories about what happens when people understand. And my first, first time I really got a picture of this was when our first graduation, which the sergeant at arms in the state house regretted as long as I knew him, uh, because it was 95 degrees and we were using chairs <laughs> from the inside, you know, those folding chairs out on the, the, the tarmac, and they all <laughs> sunk, they all sunk into the pavement into the tar, and then we pulled them out, and all the rubber stuff so the bottom of the chairs. So it looked like it'd been a pogo stick convention for for eight graduates. He was not at Reed Payne is his name. Uh, I'm sure he never forgot me either. Um, but this woman Nancy Burns came up to me, and she said, she ran a childcare center in Montpelier, and she said, "Thanks for the degree, and thanks for the classes, you know, and thanks for the assessment of prior learning." But she said, what I really want to thank you for is that now I know I'm a learner, and I've been a learner all my life, and I'm never going to stop learning. And I thought, holy, well, I won't tell you what I actually thought, but <laughs> holy, we'll go with holy moly. Um, because she had become a reflective person in the process of going through her assessments and her learning. And once you learn the power of reflection, which I expect most of us in this room have developed formally or informally, you are, you're a learner. You're beginning to extract meaning from everything you do, good or bad, happy or sad. You're beginning to be more in charge of understanding the consequences of things that you engage in. And so I went back and said, that was the beginning of my first book, which was called Hidden Credentials, because the idea was, God, all these people walking around with all this knowledge, and we don't recognize it. And they don't recognize it, and then, but there's something we can do about it. So it, it really, um, and so personal learning, and I'm going to, a, a, a couple of stories here, if I can just get them, and I'll try not to um, bore you to death with it, but uh, one, of, one is a guy, a guy I interviewed here. Um, named Jason, and I'll leave it at that since, uh, although he did give me, his name's in the book. Um, and he's talking about his personal learning. One of the things I had to do was write an essay. He had flunked out of college twice, okay? Uh, once he said it was his fault, once it was life's fault. But then 10 years later, he goes back. One of the things I had to do was write an essay that told my story from high school to that point in time, 20 years. I was astonished at how much I had forgotten about what I had done and what it had meant to me. I had forgotten so much of what I had done and learned. I loved the experience, and it changed my life. The unanticipated gift was something very powerful mentally and emotionally. When I first dove into it, I thought there wasn't going to be any there there. I wouldn't have enough learning, but I was selling myself short. Wow. You know, that's, that's about more than getting an associate degree. That's about repositioning your, yourself in life. Or another problem with, with the, I'll call it a problem, with the denial, I call it knowledge discrimination. We discriminate in the book, and this has not made some people happy, but, or made some people not happy. Uh, but we discriminate based on where you learn something, not how well you know it or what you can do with it. And as I'll get to, there's a huge waste, human as well as economic. So this guy, Phil Barrett, my boss was talking about retiring in a few years, and I wanted to sit in his chair. His job description required a bachelor's degree. And I got my associate degree, and I had spent my time taking classes that were convenient, one-week seminars, one-day workshops. I'd accumulated all this time and experience, and I'd never gotten credit for it. I discovered there's a college nearby that would consider giving you credit for learning you've done outside of school. So I looked into it and it made a big difference because I received a lot of credit. But beyond getting the credit, it changed the way I thought about things. As I got more into the programs, I found out that I knew way more than I thought I did. And I started listing all the things I had done and I realized I knew more than I thought. I think we lose knowledge because we aren't challenged to use it. So, and this, these, there are a lot of stories like this. And to go to Alan Tuff's point, uh, I'll talk about a woman named Julia Weber, uh, who uh, is an HR director 
uh, in a new company in Denver. It was a new company when I interviewed her. And they were trying to figure out what to do with professional development because they didn't have a professional development program. And so they thought they better get one together. And she says, um, so I enrolled in a webinar. They're discussing a learning survey. This was another group. I was blown away by what the research revealed, namely that people learn very important and sophisticated things informally. They learn all the time and in many different ways. I was blown away. Then I put the same questions to my in-house learning needs assessment, and guess what? I found out the same thing. Going in, we believed there wasn't any learning going on because we weren't providing any programs. But even without a formal program, our people were learning skills, behaviors, and talents that they needed all the time. It turned out that over 75% of my organization had learned something informally, but purposefully, in the last week. So the point, the point of the matter is that there is this enormous richness of learning. There is talent which is something that has been developed. There is capacity, which is the thing that lets us develop talent and knowledge. And it is not a restricted commodity uh, to people who are fortunate enough, as I was, and as most of us were, to get it right, get, get lucky the first time around. I have a new definition of my privilege as a result of these interviews, which is I have never lost a fight that I didn't choose. So I lost a fight to the NRA. Some of you know that. I picked it. I made a choice. I'm going to fight these guys. I'm sorry I didn't win, but that's OK. And there have been a few other times. But the point is, I'm talking to people here who are losing fights every day. They never asked for. And they operate without the support and the encouragement that we take, I think most of us take, as an item in our lives. So to me, this is more than just, it transformed it from being more than just a value that would be preferable academically to, uh, given the technology and all the things that are enabling learning today, uh, it, became, it becomes, I think, an issue of social justice. I'll, I'll say small s, small j, but, but what, kind of a, what kind of an opportunity net do we want to have for people? If we know these things to be true, people learn all the time, they spend 700 hours a year, it's got value, we can help them figure it out, that helps them do things humanly, economically, socially, civically that they couldn't have done before. And the way it, the way it weighs on people, this knowledge discrimination, um, this woman wrote me an email at one point. I'm an experienced older American worker. I've gained streams of workplace experience that were obtained without a formal education. My life situation forced me to take this path. Now to get the same job I felt for so many years, I need a degree. I can't change my past, but what about me now? I shouldn't be ruled out. People like me hold wells of workplace experience that are still useful and productive, but I don't know what to do. Or this guy, Alan, who emailed me and said, I'm one of the two-thirds of Americans without the degree that you mentioned. I was writing a blog at that point. I've, I've acquired New, I've been running my own business. I've learned a whole lot. Now I'm at a point in my life when I want to move on, but my, any job listing I come across that I am qualified for, I don't meet the educational requirements. And so the point is, because of the emerging revolution, this, this con set of consequences for people has become unnecessary. It's become solvable. It's become something that we can, and, and I think here in Vermont we do a a much better job than in many places we can always do better as we understand what the opportunities are. The other, the, the, the flip side of this is something that I call in the, in the book the parchment ceiling. Um, and it is exactly what Alan and Faith are experiencing. They can't break through to a future that they want um, without that piece of paper. And uh, there are either going to be alternatives, which I think there will be, but also that colleges are going to have to learn how to respond humanly to meeting people where they are in their life's journey, understanding what they know, what they bring with them, and then what's the gap and what do they need to know so that we all know the journey we're on. And that's what I think CCV Today uh, does so marvelously. The, 
I mentioned the talent and the capacity, and I'm going to stop in a minute here and uh, see if there are any questions, because I could read you I can read you stories all night. Um, and there, I mean, another woman I talked to in Montpelier, she says, "Well, I'm, my family was new to America, and I." Um, was the first one to graduate from high school and never even thought about college. And, and so I graduated from high school, got married, had a baby, got divorced. Now I'm coping. I'm just coping. And so eight years later, she's driving around with her son, Billy. And she says, Billy, what do you want to do? And he says, well, I want to be a marine biologist, but I guess I can't. And she said, why? He said, because neither you or dad went to college. So I guess I'm not going. She said, that was it. She went home that night, I'm happy to say, called the Community College of Vermont. And by the time I caught up with her, she had her baccalaureate degree and was working on her master's degree. Uh, but, and I said, so what's up with Billy? She said, oh, he's a senior in high school. He's going to the university next year. And I said, what's he going to do? He said, well, marine biology. She said, no. I said, well, well what happened? What's he going to do? She said, oh, he's going to be a civil engineer. He's changed it. But what you see, and if you think about it, we've all been, I know I've been through it, and I write some of my own personal experiences, you come to a turning point in your life where you know that if you can, you've got to do something. And how you handle that, how you're able to handle that turning point, for me leaving the United States Congress was, to put it mildly, a pretty major turning point. And I had mentors and friends like Sister Janice Ryan, and I write about who helped me understand what wobbles up and what I might do and what I might not do. But there's all these other people who don't have friends like Sister Janice Ryan or other people to help them sort this stuff out. Uh, and so you, you come to a turning point, and if you can use you, learning of any kind, it's usually negative you can have a powerful transition. That's what Nancy Burns was talking about. It's what Jason DeForge was talking about. It's, it's what, it's what um, Kelly Lawrence was talking about. And these stories are all people who got to a point where they said something's got to change. And they were able to reach out to an adult-friendly institution and get the support they needed to make the change. And what I'm arguing here is that these very drivers that make this possible can be adopted by employers as well as institutions of higher education and we can do miraculous things with people that were probably at scale anyway impossible um, 45, 50 years ago. I mean, we used to assess prior learning and you know, people would walk around with huge cartons because, I mean, Xerox machines were brand new and dial phones were it. <laughs> So we, we, you know, the paper guys loved us. Now you can do that all online. You can get great job information online. You can do gap analysis. You can do all sorts of stuff. So the point is um, that we have the ability. And I think the thing we think about this is all the right thing to do, a good thing to do, a, maybe a moral thing to do. Uh, I agree with all of that. But in terms of the the good of the country, and I don't know the Vermont data, so um, and those of you that know me know that I have a way of sort of doing things on the back of a matchbook and then saying, voila, so I'm going to do a little of that. There are 60 to 90 million people in this country with a high school diploma and no college or some college but no degree. There's an argument about how many, but it's a lot. So let's take 60 million. We know there are 6 million jobs that are unfilled, going begging. We also know that, and I can't put a number so I'll leave them out, millions of people are underemployed. And because of the things we're talking about here, we can't upskill people in the workplace because we haven't, the, the traditions of the, uh, how we treat and educate the workforce haven't changed in too many cases. And I know it's something you're working on, which I think is really cool. So let's say, and the, and the data is something like, if you've got a certificate after high school, you're going to make $6,000 a year more. You've got an associate degree, you're going to make eight or nine or 10000 more. If you've got a BA, you're going to make twelve or thirteen. Well, let's just take 10000 as an average. OK? 
Or pick five if you like. I like 10 because I can multiply by 10. What's 6 million times 10,000 in earned income every year? 60 billion dollars. That sounds like a lot of groceries at the corner store, a lot of self-esteem, a lot of taxes for, you know, because we all know who's paying the taxes in this country now. Uh, never mind, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> But the, point, but the point is, all that talent, that wasted talent, has a cost. It's a human cost. It's a social cost. It's an economic cost. Self-esteem, earning, the whole thing. Now, I know the picture I just painted is not realistic in the sense that there are a whole lot of other reasons why those jobs are vacant. But the opportunity we have to add human value, respect, economic, social, civic value to the lives of our communities and in so doing enrich the base of those communities is awesome. And uh, I know in Vermont we're wrestling with small rural schools and people leaving rural communities and moving to the cities or doing whatever. And there are solutions to this. I'm not signing up to try to dream them up, but we can do something about it, whether it's New Mexico or Vermont or downtown Washington, D.C. So my point is simple. In this book, I wanted to try to show the way forward, not in terms of models, because there are going to be more models than, you know, Carter has pills. That's, that's an old metaphor, you know, Carter's little liver pills. Um, there, there's more. <laughs> um, there's going to be a lot of different models, but they're going to have characteristics. So all I try to do here is tell the human story as to why this is damned important for us all to do beyond being a cool educational idea. And then to, to say what, if you're trying to develop an adult-friendly program or you're looking for one or you're looking for an employer who is uh, treating people in a different way, what are the characteristics you would look for? What are the, what, what are the, you know, Rather than, there it is, it's like, that's the campus, let's go. It's not going to be that simple. It's going to be, what are the characteristics of these programs? And what does it mean to be adult friendly? How do you understand standards? How do you understand quality in an environment where we just assumed it? Because it happened there, in that campus. And it's going to become, I think, quality is going to become much more precisely defined. And I think it's going to be interesting enough, great news for liberal arts and liberal arts, um, uh, the soft skills, human skills you get studying liberal arts, because it turns out that's what employers are looking for that they're not getting today. When they get the graduates who have done occupationally oriented baccalaureate programs, they find that they're really good at that stuff. But when it comes to critical thinking, adapting on the job, writing well, all those kinds of things, not so good. And so there, this isn't the end of one thing and the beginning of another in terms of what's important for people to learn and know. It's how we do it and how we can do it with many more people and do it, I think, successfully with many, many more people. So as those of you who know me know, I could go on for another hour and a half. But, uh, out of respect for all of you, I'm not going to do that. And I'd love to take any questions or thoughts or disagreements. Yes? Um, I'm, I'm thinking I have two thoughts. Um, and if you agree with those two thoughts, then I'm looking for a law that brings those two together. There was a time when higher education was for the elite. And with the cost of education today, it almost feels like we're going in that direction again if we're not there already. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm hearing from families is that they're encouraging, this is Vermont mostly, mm -hmm. uh, I can't say you know, nationwide, but uh, that they're encouraging their kids at looking at a two year, going to community college for two years and then transferring mm -hmm. to get their bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. Yet, having worked with adult learners myself, I know many who went to CCB. And what was, the, there were many things that they valued, but one of the biggest things that they valued 
were other people their age. <laughs> and so they could, you know, you, you had people who were motivated, and it's not to say that 18-year-olders, I'm not saying that 18-year-olders are not motivated, but they're very different mm -hmm. learners than those who have worked for a while and are going back to school. So what does that model look like? And if you have kids who are going to two years, let's say community college at 18, and then you also have these adult learners who want to be with adults. Um, I'd say it's lucky for the kids. Uh, seriously, <clears throat> I think the average age of a community college student is still high 20s, low 30s. So it's come down a little bit. But the, the fact of the matter is, if you think of a, um, a perfectly capable high school graduate, and you put them over here for $25,000 a year, I'm making the number up, with a whole bunch of other people their own age who don't quite know what they want. Or you can put them over here for $5,000 a year with a whole bunch of other people who are very purpose-driven and trying to figure out what they want. I would argue that that second is a much better learning environment for them. And the mistake that any college could make um, would be to start organizing their services around the 18-year-olds inside the pedagogical environment and the assessment environment, um, in which case they would become less friendly to adults. That would not be good, but if they can figure, uh, I think, see it as a strong learning relationship and situation for the younger people precisely because of who they're hanging out with. Jason DeFord said a really important thing. He says, I learned, um, computer, uh, and I learned how to work computers at the print shop I worked at. And then I assessed and I got out of, I'm going to make the numbers up, I got out of computer 101 and 102. So now I'm in computing 103. And I'm doing just fine, he says. But he said, what's really interesting is the other people in the class who've learned it all in school don't know how to do it. I know how to do it. They know it. I know how to apply it. It was just, he said it so, he said it a lot better than I just said it. But what he, what he was saying is that if we could get to a more problem-based, project-based learning, and I actually think the workplace could be the learn place of the future. Well, why not, if I'm working on a strategic plan, could that be part of a learning experience? Or if I'm learning supervisory skills, could that be part of a learning experience? Yeah, I think so. So it, I think that, that the workplace is gonna be, um, going to be an important part of the learning terrain. I don't know what your experience here is at that, this point, but once employers begin to figure some of these things out, I think it's going to be. So I think good concern could be done poorly, but um, at the end of the day, um, the, the other thing I will say, we saw this, I never could get my hands around the information until I was in California. And we had people leaving in the first two years, and I thought that's, you know, they, they're, they're called dropouts. So we went back and talked to people, and it turned out, yeah, for some, wrong fit. For some, home life, you know, stuff happens. But for some, they got what they came for. They wanted to take five courses in XYZ. They took five courses in XYZ, and they went home. And we call that a failure, and they got what they came for. So we got to learn how to count better um, because the, if what you're after is a baccalaureate degree, fine. But if what you're after is a personal or professional learning or occupational learning goal, you know, that is very personal to you and you meet that goal, that should be, a, that should be called a success, not a dropout. So changing our understanding of participation patterns and rates and all that, I think, in a reasonable way, not, I mean, you could do that really badly too, but I think, I think that would help us understand why people come and go a lot better than we do know. I hope that's helpful. And yes, sir. So you, you, in the book, you, you make a reference to the parchment ceiling. I think a lot about all the mythology that surrounds the parchment. The mythology from the learner about what it means or could mean um, in a in a in a, um, in a in an economy where um, 
few jobs are chasing lots of candidates, I think it, it, there's a mythology that means that it's a, that's some sort of a benchmark that has more meaning than it does. And, and, and you also made a reference to, you know, I don't want my brain surgery done by somebody who's right. learned it on their own. And yet, in many, many fields, we're seeing employers say, the parchment doesn't guarantee me anything. That's right. So I'm not going to value it any longer. And I wonder how that starts to chip away at that mythology. I was, uh, that's a, a great question, um, Tim. And they, I think in the next two years, you will see the beginning of um, sort of algorithmically driven um, quantification or val validation of learning and ability to do things that is far more reliable or spe at least specific um, than what traditionally colleges have done. And, and I, I'm working with, there's a group called Strata and they have an advisory group on the future of work and I'm lucky enough, you know, I continue my graduate education by hanging around smart people and learning a lot. Um, but what they're finding is that one of the big problems is that employers and academics are using tr totally different language to describe the same thing. So there's just, there's no connection in terms of the language or the understanding. In both cases, neither are being rigorous enough in their breaking down what it is they really want in terms of job holding skills, which are more of the liberal arts, cross-cutting, soft human <laughs> skills, job getting skills, which are the technical, you know, I can do accounting, whatever it might be. And they need both. Um, and so what people are working on, there's a group called Credential Engine that now has something like 35,000 certificates in an active uh, database, and they're trying to figure out the algorithmic ways to read it. And, but the idea being that there will be a common language that will also be hierarchical that will explain the value of something you know or are able to do. And if you think about it, all that information about me or you or anyone, it's the same data. Over here you're using it for academic requirements, over here you're using it for employment requirements. But if you can figure out the translations, you can do a much better job. Now, danger, stranger, in the whole thing is that we get so artificially structured that we, we suck all the life out of everything. And I, for one, uh, don't want the government to set those standards. Uh, you know, I don't mind if there's some competing sets of standards and there's a robust discussion. But what, what we need to include is what I call evidence that I know the title of the course. I'll just use it like accounting or supervisory management one. And then we need another set of outcomes that are how do I employ that knowledge? Project-based, problem-based. What have I been asked to do that then creates evidence that I not only know it, but I can apply it, right? And then there are some more behavioral things, like when Peter Smith was a sophomore at Princeton, he thought he was gonna be a diplomat. And um, <laughs> this nice man, in the Woodrow Wilson School took me aside and said, you know, Peter, I, I really don't think you're going to make a very good diplomat. I think you probably ought to think about something else. And I was crushed, but was he right or wrong? He was dead right. It was, and that was a behavioral analysis because he cared enough to get to know me and that was a wonderful part of my life there. And just knew instinctively that that was not going to be a good, very productive match. So, but we can do that now. Gallup has a, has a thing called the Strength Finder, whatever it is, there, where you can actually learn the way you process information and how that affects your behavior. So, I mean, surprise. Well, this might, part might be, I'm ADHD, never knew it. You know, what a shock. Um, never knew it until I was 50. So I was having a little trouble on my job, so I went and got diagnosed. And, um, so what happened was the guy said, um, do, you, do you like to draw attention to yourself? Do you like to advocate and make speeches? 
And he just started asking me a whole, and I said, yes, yes, yes. And I said, why? And he said, because that's the way you organize communication. Because if you're in a crowd and you're not organizing all that noise, it's just noise and it's almost painful. But if you can organize it so you're always doing the back and forth, then you can handle it. Well, that made me feel better for all the times I know that I had done that. And, and, uh, and, but there are, my point simply is that it, it, when you understand how you process information, and there are something like 35 ways you make sense out of the world, and everybody has five ways they do it most of the time, and of those five, two are the way they really do it. And if you understand that kind of stuff, which is soon going to be available contextually to anybody who wants to do it for a tiny amount of money, you can understand why Peter Smith wouldn't have been a good diplomat or airplane pilot or certified public accountant, because he never met a detail that didn't drive him crazy. And then that wasn't elected. It was just the way I came onto the earth. You know? So there's all these things are going to, I think, be available at, finger t at the fingertips. And the question is, huge question is, how do we handle it humanly? so that we don't get caught in a world of algorithms um, that tell us things. Like, if somebody had told me I was a good salesman when I was 16, oh, maybe I would have gone into real estate. Well, you know, part of what I did at CCD was sell an idea. So I, I'm pretty glad I didn't take all these assessments <laughs> when I was 16. So there's a lot of, lot of downside that can happen, but the thing is the potential to ground people in a reality uh, of their choosing that can bridge, and you're gonna see a bridging between some higher education institutions and major employers and third party nonprofits to look for common language and common validations. I, I, it gives me the willies, frankly, a little bit, but if we do it well, it will be a real plus for the people who are trapped at losing fights they never picked. Other questions? Got to say, my uncle Jeff is here. He's a, a gifted poet, and I really I'm honored you're here to listen to some low-level nonfiction writer. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for coming. Any other questions? You are, yes, sir, so Richard. So have you seen the uh, United States education system in 20, 25 years? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. I, I actually, uh, well, if I couldn't guess the future of the Community College of Vermont, how the hell can I guess the future of anything else? Um, I think what you're going to see, Clayton Christensen, who's the disruption guy, predicted that 50% of all colleges will be out of business in 20 years. I think he's wrong. When did he predict? Uh, about three years ago. Um, and I understand, I mean, there is a serious disruption. But what you're going to see is some colleges, frankly, aren't going to do anything. Princeton would be one of them. Well, at Princeton and Northwestern and Chicago and the Columbia School of Physicians and Surgeons have all done is create a debt-free graduation for any student because they got the endowment to do it. So at Princeton, I'm proud, one of the few things I've been really proud of. That is a lot. So at Princeton, they, they figured out that they were need blind on the front end, but people were leaving after two years because they were accumulating all this loan debt and they just freaked them out because they were first generation colors. So they made the commitment that if you graduate, I believe it's in five years, we will pay every debt you have within a circumscribed amount, you know, room, board, tuition, transportation, all that. We'll pay it off when you graduate. And Northwestern, I believe, has done the same thing. Uh, Columbia Physicians and Surgeons, too late for my son Ben, unfortunately, has done it. So there, that's an adaptation to what we're talking about. They got the money to do it, okay? It doesn't solve the problem. Then you'll have adapters who are going to adapt their programs, and they're going to, and you're going to see, I think, many more low residency programs, and 
you know, technologically enhanced delivery systems, and I think there may be some of the solutions for Vermont's rural K-12 system in there. Um, but it's going to be institutions that say, we got to do this to stay relevant. And they're going to have some that go out of business. And in the meantime, like if you want to have um, one example, there's a new university or college called Minerva. And if you want to go home and Google Minerva, I don't know why they picked the name, but oh, springing out of, the pool. Uh, of, of course, I forgot that part. Uh, uh, <laughs> but Minerva, you sign up, and in four years, if you go to four years, you study on four continents, you do community service and learn the language in the four countries you work in, you're going to college, uh, do you want exercise, you go to the local YMCA or whatever it is, and then you go to college at the same time, and it is a, everybody's taking the same curriculum, so you have a local instructor who's there to work with you, but you have one worldwide expert leading the lectures that are delivered technologically. So you have Singapore, Melbourne, Paris, London, Cape Town, Delhi, boom, boom. You may have 100 people listening to a course, and then it's all the same with the same standards. And then they turn off the boob tube, and you're sitting there with a local professor, who, and it costs something like $18,000 a year. Now, and that was actually started by somebody who actually had a Holland uh, background. So, of course, it's well-branded. The signals in the marketplace. I missed the word in quotation. Harvard. Oh, okay. um, oh that place. That place. Um, but the, but the, point, the point is, it's, it's just a really interesting model that a bunch of men and women thought up, um, or Georgia Tech, which has got one of the five best computer science on-campus master's programs with 150 of the brightest people in the country for $60,000 a year, I think it is, and now they've created an online master's in computer science, exactly the same curriculum. Same degree, same standards. They got 2,000 students in that program paying $15,000 a year. The retention rate in the second program is something like 88%. They're all working, okay? When I asked the guy at Georgia Tech, what did you learn that you didn't expect to learn? He laughed and he says, really interesting. We are so used to skimming the best. We learned two things. We are so used to skimming the best for our 150, 75 a year, two year program that we, were, we would admit them and then we'd fight to get the 75 we wanted. But we were just skimming. Over here, we had to figure out if they knew enough to do the work. Could they benefit from the program? Were they ready for it? He said, that's a totally different judgment. And I thought to myself, yeah. And, and when you think about what that dynamic suggests, here's a whole bunch of plenty talented, bright people. They're working. They probably had to go to work right out of college, or maybe in some cases high school or community college. And they're coming back, and they're, able to, they're, they're capable of doing the work. And Georgia Tech has figured out a way for them to do that work and benefit economically and knowledge-wise. That's, that's a big deal as a model. Now MAT is about to do the same thing. And I worked on the MIT Open Courseware Advisory Board 20 years ago. They were afraid to have a program. So this is the second thing they learned at Georgia Tech. It didn't hurt their on-campus program. They could still get 75 very, very bright people to come and be there for two years. Um, and didn't hurt it. Meanwhile, they got 2,000 people over here, and they're learning how to do their whole business with different people a different way. And in the book, a woman named Danica Parker, Canadian, I, I don't, can't remember how I found her, but she was going to the MIT edX. It's one of the big MOOCs. And they had a deal that if she, I mean, it wasn't just her, if you took eight courses and passed them, and then you took an exam, and you passed the exam, you could come and finish a master's at MIT in whatever it was, I can't remember the, the degree program now, in six months. So she's taking eight courses for $500 a piece in Vancouver, British Columbia, kicks them, 
takes the test, kicks the test, goes to MIT. She wrote me the other day, because I, I wrote them all to see if they had gotten the books uh, I'd sent them and how everything was going. And she said, it's hard to imagine that when I talked to you a year ago, I had done none of this. And in six months, I took, the, I think it was eight courses, and the whole thing cost her something like fourteen or $16,000. That's a different world. And so there are adaptations, to, to your point, there are adaptations coming from the rich and the powerful and the, and the best ever. And so it isn't, it isn't just one part, but then there are going to be other colleges that are figuring out how to just make more sense to the people who live within 40 miles of where they are. So I think there'll be a lot of adaptation. But linking it to work, every one of my adult-friendly presidents that I interviewed, starting with Dr. Judy, um, said, if you can't help people understand work, not to just train them for it, and none of that was the point, but to help them understand the economic consequences of what they're doing, and making sure that it's relevant and that you're giving them the whole coterie of skills and, and knowledge they need, we're all going to have to do that much better. And the people I talk to all agree. They all, they all have different models, five different colleges, five different models. But they all said essentially the same thing, which is relating knowledge to work in a human and interesting way is critical. And we're, we're not good at it. Right? Yeah. Have I bored you to death? Anyway. Yeah. I think it's a good time to uh, say thank you and before anybody goes to sleep right in front of me. And no, I thank you so much I mean, for coming out on a beautiful night. And um, I, hope, I hope this was interesting. And thank you, George. <laughs>